So everyone, this is Dr. Carla Phillips, and she is an aquatic uh, veterinarian, aquatic animal veterinarian, and she's from Trinidad. And Carla, can you in introduce yourself so I, so I have all the details? Carla was recently awarded uh, the Caribbean Award for Excellence. Can you tell me the, the full name of the award as the only aquatic oh. veterinarian? Yeah, so it's actually the... Um... Anthony N. Sabga, or ANSA, um, Caribbean Award for Excellence in the um, area or the category of science and technology um, for my work with aquatic animal medicine um, in the Caribbean. Oh, so, that's so, yeah. that's really wonderful. Congratulations. Thanks so much. Thank you. So tell me, um, you and I went to school together and not together. We went to the same school. I'm <laughs> ahead of you, a little bit ahead of you. And yes. we both studied um, aquatic animal health and diseases. So as a veterinarian, what is your specialty? When you went back to Trinidad, what, what did you do in Trinidad? Right. So now prior to, so we, same school that we went to, University of Florida. Um, prior to that, I was actually a large animal veterinarian for uh, about three years or so. So I'm dealing with livestock. Um, and actually, that's what I did my master's in, so large animal medicine. Um, and then I went into aquatic medicine. That's where where, um, where our paths would have crossed. <laughs> and um, and um, on returning to Trinidad, um, I essentially um, started the aquatic animal health unit at the uh, UV School of Veterinary Medicine, um, where I had been before in large okay. animal medicine as a teaching assistant, but went back now in the capacity as... Um, an aquatic animal health clinician and of course there was no um, aquatic medicine was not a, a, a component of the veterinary curriculum right so, so why did you think why did you think it was important because I remember when um, I went back to Jamaica in 2006 and I tried to introduce the science of aquatic animal health and disease diagnostics and it was not something that anybody had ever heard or yes. thought it was needed. It was like off the realm of, of something that was a science. So why did you think it was important and how did you, how were you able to get it started? Right, correct, absolutely correct. It was the same um, um, situation for the most part in Trinidad. Nobody, um, even today, I still hear you're, an, you're a what? What kind of vet? An aquatic right. vet? I didn't even right. know those things existed. Never even heard of that, you know, even today. Right. Um, 11 years later, I meaning 11 years since I had returned to, to Trinidad, because I returned to Trinidad in, to, in 2010. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's been 11 years um, since I had been back there and um, and actually got things started and, and get, got it to where it is today. Now, um, like you rightfully said, nobody really knew anything about it, but the aquaculture sector, um, the fish production aspect of things had been um, a developing field that had been growing for at least a, at least two decades by by that right. point at least right mm -hmm. um, but it was all about production production principles but the health management of the animals that are raised in these production systems was all but completely neglected you know like right. it was not something. Um, that people really focused on. I mean, just like how we have clinics for the dogs and the cats and the horses. The exactly. Sheep, the goats, the for livestock. Know. Right. The livestock. Fish, the, um, these animals get sick too. Right. And the issue that we have in aquaculture production systems is that very often, especially if you're doing it on a commercial scale, be it food production or commercial, you're dealing with animals that are more very often, especially for if it's for profit, for gain, they're going to be right. an intensive production system. So they're going to be crowded in some measure and they're going to be um, exposed to stressors. And animals right. that are crowded and that, are, that have some kind of stressors imposed upon them are going to be susceptible to, to, diseases. to diseases, even yeah. more so than on, on stress. Same thing with humans. When we're stressed, we come down with every, every exactly. cold that passes by. Right. But if we're not, right, so in intensive production systems, especially um, intensive and semi-intensive production systems, animals are, in, are, are exposed to stresses and they will get sick. And the issue is that when they do, because of how many animals are in that system, diseases spread quickly. So right. a, producer, a producer can then literally lose everything 
in a very, very short span of time. Exactly. All Probably. of that work done, gone down the drain. Exactly. exactly. Time, money, effort down the drain. You're talking about months and sometimes years of work, right? And, and expensive animals, especially when you're dealing with um, um, intensive food produ producing animals, like they brood stock. Important animals, expensive animals, and if you do also with ornamentals, ornamentals, because Jamaica has a very good ornamental industry, and Absolutely. their stock are valued very highly. So there Correct. needs to be some kind of a uh, system for health management. That's right. If you think about koi, I mean, in parts of the world where one koi would go for several million U.S. dollars for one, right. like we're talking about it, it has the potential to be a very Lucrative. Um, expensive and lucrative business. So the health management of these animals should be equally important as with any of our other species. And fortunately, um, the director of the school at the time, um, Professor Desun, um, he recognized that importance. And um, with me have it coming back, he said, Carla, no, I hope you're coming back. I hope you're, 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 you're coming back to help us. And he said, well, I want you to, um, I want you to help us to build aquatic medicine into the veterinary curriculum because he recognized that this aspect of health was right. missing um, and it needed to be developed further and really be um, introduced as a core component of the veterinary curriculum. So um, in 2010, September 2010, I returned and, and he gave me a tour. They had actually started um, trying to get something started before. There was a little aquaculture section, as they called it, um, yeah. aquaculture, again, called the production thing. It wasn't called aquatic health or aquatic health and management. It was called aquaculture, the production thing. And I said, you know, so what's two, what, it's what two heck? different aspects altogether. It's a part of it, but it's that's a separate it. science altogether. Exactly. And that's what I said to him. I said, okay, first thing at, at the School of Vetna, one of the things I would, I, I would suggest we do is change the name of this um, fledgling budding unit that you had going. It didn't work out. You know, things things for, for a number of reasons just didn't work. Um, right. And it, it it really wasn't in a state where it um, could be used for teaching aquatic medicine. Um, I said, so one of the things that I, I would suggest is that, you know, aquaculture production is really something that we do in other faculties in UE, in the science and technology part. It's the production side of things, like the animal production side of things, which is all part of it. We deal now right. with the health of those animals, right? right? So I really think we should rebrand and we should call it the Aquatic Animal Health Unit. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's been ever since, the Aquatic Animal Health Unit. And as part of that, um, I said, well, in order to, 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 to look at health, you have to be able to diagnose diseases. So we need a lab. So we started the Aquatic Animal Health Diagnostic Laboratory, which moved in tandem as part of the Aquatic Animal Health Unit. And he had so true insight. He had he had a uh, real true insight because that's exactly yeah. what we need in Jamaica, and that's something that um, I know that the vet lab has something, but to have you know the science of aquatic animal health uplifted to its own area, apart from yeah. livestock, apart from cats and dogs, and to understand the significance of why we need aquatic animal health and biosecurity. So I know you do a lot with One Health. I mean, how, tell me about how does that bridge between animals and humans? Why we need to also talk about that? Absolutely. So um, I, I uh, uh, within the last couple of years, I really, um, and I say this at each time I, I chat um, in these kinds of forums, I say really, I, I see myself more as an aquatic One Health practitioner, more so than an aquatic veterinarian. And okay. what I mean by that is I have recognized now that, uh, that more so the vast majority of what I do really is about not just, it's not just about the animals that I, that I look after or, or look, look into their, 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 their health. It is about how their health is impacted by the environment, how right. they have an impact on the environment. On the environment, and, yeah. And then on top of that, they're not doing this alone. There are humans in this mix. There are humans taking care of these animals. There are humans interacting in the environments in which these animals are living. And there are diseases that these animals have that they can pass on to humans and that they shed into the environment. So the three are intricately interconnected. 
So aquatic health is really not just about the health of aquatic animals. It's about the health of aquatic animals. It's about the health of aquatic environments. And it's about the health of the humans that interact with these animals and these environments. So yeah. the diseases that we see, really it's not just about treating the health of the animals because we now need to say, be careful, you can get this too. And this, if you do get this, how do you deal with it? Or how do you prevent yourself from getting it? How do you right. secure your environment so that the animals within that environment do not get infected? How do you keep these diseases out? So it's really a whole lot more than, you know, run, sitting on your lab and growing some bacteria. Yeah. And say, okay, and not even that. It's, it's, fish. it's just fish. It's just, you know, <laughs> fish is always, it's just fish. No, it's even exactly. more than that. And I, when I've been on the farm, I have, you know, try to educate i mean we have um mycobacterium right that's something that's transmitted yeah. from fish to humans it's a type of a tuberculosis i don't th think a lot of farmers know about that also um the chemicals that they're using you know correct it's called like msd um files the no understanding MSD. what are the chemicals yeah. that you're using on the farm correct. formalin which is like Use like it's it's nothing, um, you know. It's carcinogenous. Yeah. So many times I'm like, do you understand where are the chemicals going? You know, things Correct. that are a part of the environment, the the treat treatments. What are, what's happening with the chemicals? So that's um, something that's really not. I don't know if you know it's thought about a lot. You know, so exactly. that's the things I'm trying to find out from farmers as well. <laughs> yeah. And it's the same thing, it's the same thing with us in, in Trinidad. And this has been a big part of, of the educational initiatives that I've been involved in as well, in trying to um and, and it's interesting how many people really do not think about what happens after these chemicals leave their their tanks. You know, they, they, they treat the tanks often indiscriminately, meaning they're not actually using proper concentration, sometimes even sub-therapeutic levels, which is a dangerous thing, especially when it comes to antimicrobial resistance, which is a whole other big aspect of, of, of One Health. But when many, I, I always say, it seems like, you know, once they throw it down the drain, out of sight, out of mind, suddenly it disappears. It's actually it's not gone. Whatever you do, it's not gone. It's actually made its way into the environment and it's having long-term, far-reaching effects. You mentioned mycobacteriosis. That's a big deal right now in, in um, that that's a big issue that I'm that I'm also dealing with, and the really? fact that it is a, it's a zoonotic agent, and yeah. you know there are and 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 for in many cases people don't realize that this is something who knows they may have and they may have had and didn't even realize that um, the the lesion that they had on their on their finger or on their toe that was not healing for months yeah. on end <laughs> they don't realize that, wow yeah it came from the fish from my fish you know. Um, and very often it goes undi undiagnosed um, when they go, if, if they go to their doctor um, yeah. to check it out. And sometimes you know, they just throw um, an over-the-counter, you know, drug at it and say, okay, well, you know, hopefully it heals. And they don't actually try to investigate and get to the underlying cause. Because if they did, they may, I may, may realize that it is this. Um, but so many doctors do know. How many, that's another thing, right? So that's well, why I think it's really important to educate farmers because correct. they will go to the doctor and the doctor will have no idea. That's right. Right? That, that has literally happened literally within this last, these last few months where, you know, I've been in, in um, chatting with, with someone who, after discussing this, the, the, the issue of mycobacteriosis with them, they were like, well, doc, you know, I've actually had a lesion for a long time. And it happened after I went into a pond. And I just, you know, I've gone to several dermatologists and they simply can't, they've thrown everything at it and it doesn't heal. Classic micro, right? And then, um, um, but now having heard this, they were able to go back to their doctor and say, could we please look for this? You right. know, and actually from the veterinary side had to give um, recommendations on how to go about looking for this because our Many of our colleagues in the human medical field no, no, simply no. Made, they simply no. don't know, and you can't call them. But it's just not something that they're um, exposed to in right. their um, right. in, in school. So 
they, they just don't know and many of them simply just don't give a second thought it to emphasize to emphasize that um i, I recently completed um supervising some students uh, in the dvm program the veterinary medicine program where we actually sent out some surveys um to persons within the ue um, um population literally anybody could have answered um from student to anybody on staff academic staff um administrative staff anybody literally anybody and included in 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 that group would have been persons in med in medical sciences so dentists uh -huh. Uh -huh. human medics um veterinarians pharmacists anybody could have answered and it was so interesting to see how many human practitioners literally said they never give us they, they had never thought about diseases of fish they didn't think it was important they no, didn't think it was just they fish. thought it was rare <laughs> it is just fish you yeah. know and you see this is why it's so important to get this is why our field is important this is why we need to get the word out we need to let people know that there are very real threats that are associated with fish production systems it's not mm -hmm. just the fish look pretty you know it's pretty big fish small fish pretty fish right. ugly fish you right. know it's not it there are very real animal health aspects mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. human health aspects and environmental health aspects right. that are linked to aquaculture production you know right. so right. very 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 pertinent very real um issues that we that we need to to address very important issues absolutely so do, so now do you currently teach about um aquatic animal diseases diagnostics how how is the lab set up was it very expensive to set up the lab uh so just two two things so the teaching and then the lab set up um so yes i do teach um about uh fish health disease uh, fish fish diseases and diagnostics um uh, as part of the the, the training at the uh, at the vet school at UWE um and in developing the lab which supports the teaching and supports the research um it was um it had its expense its expenses associated with it but I, I i i think i would make a plug for saying you know you really don't necessarily have to have the absolute most expensive equipment to to, to at least do uh, a decent job and mm -hmm. as the as the more expend as the, as your finances become more um you can add more things. Been, you can yeah. add more but there are some basic tools that you can that that well there's something you absolutely have some must have some basic you must have a microscope you can't deal with fish health with and not have a microscope right so there are some there are some things that are basic necessities that you must um, make that initial investment and 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 acquire um uh things like um bacterial um identification you have okay. to have some system to do bacterial identification and keep in and uh, I, i was going to say keep in mind but uh, folks listening may not necessarily know that you know some of the pathogens that we see in aquatic animals they they actually grow at a different temperature to mm -hmm. the pathogens that are, that are in uh, domestic species so right. our we have to make our environment the our growth environment for the bacteria um in keeping with what is the environment that they would grow in if they were in a pond so we have to kind of right. mimic that type okay. of setting so from that perspective you want the laboratory conditions are a little different to what um is traditionally done in if you're doing diagnostics on a dog or a cow or a pig or something like that right. um but the principle is the same but you just have to adapt the conditions so that it mimics what happens in a fish or what happens in a pond so to speak okay. right um mm -hmm. and then of course uh, the the pathogens that we see um uh, a little different as well so you have to have a system of identifying those different right. pathogens so but once you understand that and and that's what my that's what my job is as 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 um an aquatic vet to understand mm -hmm. this and then put those find the most effective and economical um ways of of getting those diagnostics set up and that's what i that's what i essentially um 
set out to do when we when we first got the lab started and then we just grew yeah. from there and now we've introduced now 10 years later we were able to introduce um to work with my graduate student um we're now able to introduce molecular testing we didn't start with molecular That's molecular fantastic. testing yeah growth you start with the basic and over time you 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 build so it's not something that's impossible to do but right. you you got to know what you're doing of course right but, so you um, so you teach only do you teach only veterinary students or are the production students being taught are farmers able to get some of this teaching or is it only veterinary students right so for the most part i teach veterinary students but i have done um in i've been invited to do lectures on the production side so they have been um in years past where i would have done a couple in um guest lectures over on the production side um you know so just about basic principles of, of fish health as it pertains to aquaculture production and the impact of things like aquaculture product aquaculture system design okay. on health so right. cuz if you if you depending on how you design your system you could actually be putting um you can literally be setting up an environment for fish disease right, right. so the impact of system design on mm -hmm. animal health and those sorts mm -hmm. of things so i've done lectures to production students um on okay. on topics such as those but i've also done um um some educational outreach initiatives um with the public like farmers and and producers and hobbyists as well actually i just got done with a a project that was funded by um the UNDP um the Jeff Small Grants program that was specifically designed to target mm -hmm. educating um farmers aquaculture producers hobbyists mm -hmm. on um diseases and diseases. um one health and biosecurity as it pertains to aquaculture production system so um so while I, within the the on a on a daily basis my focus is on the vet students i right. also um have these opportunities and sometimes try to create opportunities to teach these um to teach other stakeholders you right. know within right. in the industry so um extension service providers extension officers with the ministry they you know i all have these opportunities to to share um right. what my, you know my my side of things with them so that it kind of helps them to build a more holistic picture as it pertains to um dealing with aquaculture production systems not just from a production side but incorporating health into, into the it, whole picture, right. into the whole business of aquaculture in the country so, correct yeah so the so, previous all the, you know the previous um farmers and scientists that I've spoken to we all agree how important aquaculture is to the region yes. and really why we feel that we, it needs to you know more attention needs to be paid to the growth but with growth um there is a potential for more disease and i think that's something that is i think is not or should be looked at the word should uh um, more before we have growth we need to put into place how we can prevent the potential diseases and um yes. there comes into play biosecurity, biosecurity. right Absolutely. so how important biosecurity is <laughs> yes exactly right so um you're ab absolutely correct we're on the same page and um and a lot of people may not may not necessarily know what biosecurity is but we by in, indirectly by what we've been saying you kind of figure out that it literally means putting measures in place to prevent the introduction of disease into uh, onto a facility or into a group of animals and if disease were present put measures in place to prevent spread mm -hmm. and if it were starting to spread put measures in place to contain that right. you know that organism to prevent it from spreading even further and getting out into you know, onto more facilities so it's really about putting these stop gap measures in place for stopping disease at the earliest possible opportunity ideally we do not want it to enter at all and there are a number right. of things that we need to do and you have to think about things from a very a very broad perspective disease entry could start at your borders 
right it, you know it, it's not, it's that's not something that really from. yeah from day one bring it bring, it bring it into the country and i always Your say my motto is prevention is better than cure exactly. <laughs> so you have Absolutely. to put it on the mitigation but you know like you said the big picture that's before, right even before you begin about which points can disease happen and so that's something that's i think right. in the future that we should talk about the stop gaps the hassock plan <laughs> that's right correct and and i remember it was interesting um as i was saying this it, it, it just reminded me of a case that i had earlier this earlier this semester um i never actually saw the client but somebody who reached out to me via email um and there was an issue and of course we did the, the pandemic also prevented us from actually seeing clients. For many oh, of us, if we didn't have health, right. the health services, you, we haven't seen a, had a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with our clients. But this was a new client, somebody, I, I do not know what this person looks like. I've literally only spoken to him by email. And I remember telling him, you know, he, you know many people say, I've been in fish production for years and I've never had to do this. And that many persons who have been in it for years uh, say I've never had disease. <laughs> Yeah, so somebody sometimes these are the harder people to, to reach and to convince and to get them to buy in because they were they were they were actually lucky that more problems. Well, I also them. believe that from what I'm beginning to understand within our aquaculture um, community is a bit secretive sometimes. So that's true. Sometimes Very true. people may have disease and they're not willing to share what is happening and Correct. that's one of the things that i i would really like for the community to open up because in oh, that's the only way to learn and to grow right yes. if somebody has a particular disease it's really important to let the scientists and the specialists know so that yes. other people can be warned of what's there because like you said some of the diseases may be imported and if That's it's not true. picked up on, then that could be a problem in the future by spreading. So Absolutely. I think it's something that um, I think we need, you know, our community needs to open up a bit more, you know, Agreed. Terms, and, and sharing with the scientists and sharing with the specialists so that we can, you know, have a, get the information out there as to what, what is happening, what diseases are you seeing, what are you experiencing um, and that's the only way to grow as, you know, as, as a country, as a region, I think, one of the things. Absolutely. And I can confirm that we, at the lab, we've actually picked up diseases that were imported into Trinidad and Tobago. Literally, mm -hmm. um, the history. Literally, you, you were able to see, okay, these animals came in on such and such a date. And they were actually exhibiting clinical signs at the point when they landed in Trinidad. Wow. It was not detected, or if it was detected, it was passed off as well. You know, Something. maybe it's nothing. Right. You know, <laughs> the animals were released to the to, to the importer. They brought it onto their facility. Animals started dying from day one, but they continued to wow. sell animals that were not dying, that were not showing signs yet. Right. Mortality continued for a week, a week and a half, and it was at the two two weeks later or weeks later when, at that point, several hundred or a couple thousand of the animals had already died, and they were okay. Well, maybe something is, but of course something is wrong, you know. And it's at yes. that point right. that they actually submitted, and then we actually found Wait. a disease that was Wait. actually <laughs> has the potential to be catastrophic. It's wow. actually an the one that I'm thinking about is an organism that is actually dreaded in the U.S. channel catfish industry, and wow. we literally brought it in in a shipment of of animals, and it went undetected, even though clinical signs were manifested from mm -hmm. the point when the animals landed, but mm -hmm. it was not picked up, it wasn't detected. So it's important that though that biosecurity aspect of things and, and more and, seriously. It exactly right, and, mm -hmm. and quite about uh, when I say catastrophic, it has the potential to be catastrophic. We, you know, when animal when fish die, what do what do owners typically do? They throw it, like flush it down the mm -hmm. toilet. If it's a little fish, 
they throw it out into the ravine in the back, you know, <laughs> they throw it in the drain. And, it, and now you've put that pathogen into the, the environment. environment. And now, now your, your um, resident animals, your, um, your native species have now been exposed to mm. an exotic pathogen. And depending on the type of pathogen, you may have, because our, our native organisms are naive to that right. pathogen, you now right. have a disease that can spread rapidly. And mm. if a particular species is indeed susceptible, it can wreak havoc on that species in your country. Right. Right? And, you know, I remember uh, I had started mentioning that the, the client who had had an email, I remember asking him about quarantining, and he asked me, what's the point of that? And I'll just leave wow. that right there. I <laughs> hope everybody understands from the pandemic what the meaning of quarantine is. It, we've You're been doing this with me. fish forever. <laughs> that, the, maybe the, 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 the pandemic has actually... Put it into the um, mind why into, quarantine why is important. Quarantine is important. And it is not just a human thing. It is important for any organism that can get disease. Mm -hmm. If you, if you are, if there's a potential for an organism to enter a population and you need to protect that population against it, then it is important to quarantine any new animals coming in that could be a source of spread or a source of introduction of that organism into your population, right? right. Just like when the borders are closed, you're trying to keep persons who are infected with COVID-19 from right. coming in and bring, it's the same the principle, right. the exact same principle that we use in animal production systems and fish are no different and that would get you know when we say that we should quarantine for four weeks right the longer the better and i would get like but one week is too, you know it, it, it's like you have to understand yes. the science has already proven oh how long it takes a quarantine takes for in order to make sure that there's no disease just stick to the Correct. science you don't have Correct. to reinvent it just don't reinvent the wheel we know this already <laughs> Exactly. And I get the same thing. I tell you, okay, 30 days minimum, your four weeks, right? 30 days minimum. I'm like, what? I can't afford that economically. I can't, by, by, the, by the end of a week, like you rightfully said, I need to get these animals out. I need to, to well, the economics of it could be a whole lot worse right. in the absence of the quarantine, you know? Um, and then I also tell folks, like, if you do see something during quarantine, if something does show up, it's very important to identify what that thing is. Don't just throw out the dead animal because it died in quarantine. The issue right. is that animal died for a reason. So you need to determine why that animal died. Mm -hmm. So get it checked out. And if we determine that it is actually something infectious or, you know, there's something, there's a problem, then you need to treat the issue while the animals are still in quarantine. And this is the part many persons don't like. I say the quarantine starts over. <laughs> So they <laughs> retreat, you get them, and everybody's looking looking good, quarantine starts again. So you, they need to go another 30 days. Until um, it's clean. Until it's clean. And, you know, and then you can introduce those animals into your established population. Could you think of the losses that you could potentially incur if you put a deadly pathogen into your already well-established stock? I see it so many times. And then right. you have all your expensive animals, all your really, really um, pricey, valuable animals that you have literally just exposed to this pathogen. You know, many people buy fish, buy ornamental, especially in the ornamental, more so in the ornamental than in the food fish um, arena, where person, they go to the pet store, they get, you know, a goldfish mm -hmm. or whatever, and they bring it home and they put it directly into their, their, their pond, mm -hmm. directly mm -hmm. into their tank. Yeah. Why would you do that? Right? <laughs> You've literally potentially introduced whatever disease, ever disease was out there. is possible. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that the, the fish are stressed, right? So Correct. They, they will eventually at some point get something just because of transportation and, you know, in a different environment. They are That's stressed. Right. So they will have something at, at, at some point. So it's just best yes. to, you know, de-stress them before you add them into the system. Correct. Shipping is a major stressor 
So transportation, and the longer the transportation, the more stressed those animals are. So if you imported a batch of fish, so they, they flew in from, you know, you, you bought something, some expensive, exotic animal that you saw online, and you brought it in from Vanuatu, right? <laughs> they imported it from Indonesia or wherever, because it's a nice... That shipping has literally caused your, that animal's immune system to be challenged. Shipping mm -hmm. is a stressor. So I, I mentioned shipping, that's airline shipping or, or sea freight. But moving an animal from the pet store to your home, that is a stressor. That is, that is just as much of a stressor, you right. know, especially depending on the transportation conditions, right? And then the acclimation procedure that you would have used to get that animal into your tank. These are all right. issues that, or these are all um, situations that cause an, the immune system of these animals to be challenged or mm -hmm. potentially compromised. And even if the animal looked happy and healthy at its point of origin, mm -hmm. when it becomes stressed, if it was harboring some type of pathogen, but because it was immunocompetent and happy and healthy, right. that organism did not have a chance to take hold and manifest itself. But when you have shipping stress or any other type of stress that causes immunosuppression or immunocompromisation or any kind of challenge to the immune system, anything that may be lying latent or dormant or just hidden, and because right. the animal is able to fight and defend against it, that pathogen now has a chance to flare up. It has a chance to manifest itself. It has a chance to take hold of its host. Right. So when you move that animal into the your tank, it is still in that immunosuppressed state. It hasn't had a chance to, right. as we say, it kept itself uh, yet. It didn't kept itself yeah. yet, you know? So you are now in a position where whatever pathogen that maybe may have been hiding under the surface can it's now manifest known. itself and it's, it's going to now known. not I'm it's here. <laughs> exactly it's going to be hey party <laughs> over here take right. over and now not only is it now restricted to that one animal it is shed into the environment into that water and every other animal that it comes into contact with Mm -hmm. now has been exposed and right. that's why quarantine is important you right. keep them in that isolated space so that if something does show itself you have kept it apart from the rest of your healthy happy stocks your established population and you will not um, expose them to something that could be potentially deadly it's right. important it's important right. it's important you know so very important issue, and we need, as as those of us in this field, we need to not give up on trying to get that very, very basic point across, because it is the point at which many people make that initial mistake that can cost mm -hmm. them thousands of dollars. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think this field is something that may be new. I mean, our viewers can correct me um, in terms of aquatic mm -hmm. animal health. Um, biosecurity is something that we really need to talk about more and yes. include in the whole field of um, growing aquaculture in the Caribbean. So absolutely, um, I look forward to to hearing more <laughs> I, I think we, i think this is yep. just a touch this is just a touch a, an introduction and a touch on the title. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much you know all the diseases all the treatments i mean there's so much within so the much. field okay. that you know yeah. um trying to prepare farmers you know for for zoonotics and the diseases that they can get so um I don't know, in the future, we need to talk about this some more. <laughs> it's something that we need, and you know, it, we, we've, I hope we've clearly established the, the importance of it, importance. you know, while we're talking, right. so it's a yes. It's a right. future right. conversations on, on specific aspects, very important, very, and I'm, I'm all for it. Couldn't, couldn't <laughs> be in more agreement, completely agree. Right, right. 
So it was it was great chatting with you and catching up. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks so, thanks so much for coming you. on. Yes, Most definitely. Awesome. And Absolutely. congrats again on on all the wonderful work that you've been doing. And I hope it can spread to the rest of the Caribbean, not just Trinidad. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it and I am happy to exam chat um you know this is already our Trinidad Jamaica connection right. you know and we continue to 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 do the word spread the word other Caribbean nations other Caribbean territories other Caribbean vets are listening or the word gets out yes we are here to help to promote aquatic health throughout our region yeah. right we it is right. this uh it is a field it's growing in, it's growing in Africa it's growing Absolutely. in Africa um you know more information is going out there and i think we need to bring it to the caribbean to our reach to the caribbean right. that's right exactly. it's already a multi billion dollar industry in other parts of the world there's no reason why the caribbean can't get together and make this something that is economically viable sustainable and profitable for our right. region we can right. do it but we need we need to be serious about it that's I the thing together. you know our Caribbean, we, we like to cut corners and the but we need to be as serious about it as other people are and it can very 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 much um have a significant impact on the economic growth of our region the aquaculture right. sector has the potential to really provide a a a, a significant um, economic contribution to right. our region so and we are here you have professionals now in the field uh dr russo myself the, those are dr russo it is the person i'm talking to for those who don't know for <laughs> <laughs> julia and myself you know we are here you know and and we're really passionate about making sure that we get the word out and um yeah i'm i'm all for it so looking forward to future conversations and um helping to to build our our caribbean region and make it, you know, what, it what it can be <laughs> what it can be what it can be okay thank you dr carlo most we'll welcome again. thank you for having me thank you for of having course. me and thanks for being tuned in um glad to be I here got it, we got it working <laughs> yes yes okay. bye <laughs> bye bye